morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, September 17th, we are studying Psalm 119, verses 129 to 136. In today's text, we pray that God would turn to us in grace and keep us steady by his promise, even as the world around us does not keep God's law. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Martin Dressler. Pastor Dressler serves at Salem Lutheran Church in Blackjack, Missouri. Pastor Dressler, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thank you very much. Always good to be here. So, Pastor, talk to us a little bit about the Psalms as a whole, and especially Psalm 119, as we prepare to look at our verses for today. Sure, yeah. The the Psalms are the, the hymnal of the Bible. And Psalm 119 is, is similar to 111 and 112 in that they're acrostics. I think one of the differences with this one is that uh, each section has eight verses, and each stanza all begins with the same letter of the alphabet. This, this particular psalm has eight different words that are, by and large, synonymous that are used throughout the psalm, and they're all kind of referencing the law or the word. So the word Torah, for example, shows up in the psalm 25 times, the word word, devar, shows up 24 times. Uh, judgment or testimony shows up about 23 times. you got command that shows up 22 times. Statute and precept both show up 21 times. And then a word that means like saying or oracle or promise shows up 19 times. So all of this is really expounding God's will, his plan for his people. And all of those synonyms occur in various stanzas. All eight will show up in the hate stanza from 57 to 64, the yud stanza from 73 to 80, uh, kof stanza from 81 to 88, and then pei, which is ours today, 129 to 136. So one of the things about Psalm 119 is obviously it's rather long. (laughs) And it can definitely see, it's not something you want to chant on a Sunday morning in its entirety. That's a... Uh, you could, but you, you might be there for a while. But it does seem rather repetitious. And one of the commentaries that I read about it says that the repetitious structure is intentional because it expresses the inexhaustibility of the Torah, of God's Word, of His teaching. I think that's so true. You know, if you think about it just in personal experience, that every time you read a passage of Scripture, something new dawns on you. You can always grab something new from it, which is why pastors can preach sermons for the last 2,000 years <laughs> on the Bible. Yeah. And uh, amazingly, every sermon is going to be at least a little bit different. I was, in a, <laughs> I was in a school board meeting the other night, and one member of our school board said something like, um, it's as boring as grass. And I almost thought, I didn't want to derail the meeting because I don't like long meetings, but I almost wanted to say, grass is incredibly interesting. <laughs> there are so many different ways you could talk about grass. Like color, the different types of grass, its relationship to soil and wind and water, the significance, the meaning that grass has for us when we see it coming out of the ground. I didn't do that because that would have taken the meeting way far afield. <laughs> I know what he meant. But I think in some ways, the psalm is like that too. This is either to consider it maybe a Torah psalm, a teaching psalm, or a wisdom psalm. And even though it, it seems repetitious, I would, I would say that, that it's not entirely saying the same thing, that there is this, this building that, that occurs throughout the psalm. One of the struggles I think that Westerners in particular have with, with this kind of psalm is the, is the sort of progression that it makes. I don't know if you remember, we had a, we had a professor um, at, at, at seminary, uh, Dr. Victor Raj. I don't know if you ever had Dr. Raj as a, as a professor. But, uh, he, he taught, I think, in, 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 the, in a way that this psalm reads. The way that my brain has been taught to think, generally speaking, is rather linear, A plus B equals C. So it's like a straight line building from one step in an argument to another. And that's definitely one way that you could organize a a speech or a a book or a psalm. But that's generally not the way that it it worked in the ancient Near East. So it was much more cyclical. 
they'd have a, a, a theme and then you'd visit the theme a little bit and then you'd expand on it and come back and circle around and expand on it again from a slightly different angle. And then it builds, I, you can almost say it builds in a less sharp way, but maybe in a more holistic way. And so I think that's absolutely what's happening in this, in this particular psalm. Yeah, the, another professor that, that we had at seminary, Dr. Reed Lessing, talked about repetition with intensity. Yeah. So it, it repeats, but there's something different about it each time that makes you think about it in a new way or a more intense way, another angle to, to take a look at it. And I, I do think you see that in Psalm 119. One of the, the things that I've noticed just reading through it eight verses at a time, especially as I take one one section a week... I sense that building as I read through it, and it's not always maybe apparent. When I get to the weekend then, and I take a couple days off from it, when I come back to it the next week, it's hard to always remember. So I think it, it built in a way to be used on a regular basis so that as these themes do repeat, you think about them in new ways, in different ways that hit you in another sex spot in your life. And so I think in that sense, Although, yes, it's repetitious, it is absolutely anything but boring as grass. It's not, it, because it just makes you think about the Word of God in so many different ways. And so I, I think it's worth doing that process, going through the psalm in that way. We Yesterday, I, I did talk to, to Pastor Sean Denzer about, they actually did chant all of Psalm 119 at the recent Worship Institute, and it took wow. him quite a while. Yeah. 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 But there, I, think there's, I think there's something to be said for both reading it or chanting it all at once, and for taking it section by section. I think we really benefit when we do that, not only with Psalm 119, but with the Bible as a whole. Yeah. And we take both large and small chunks, we really benefit from it. Yeah, no, it's so true. I was thinking about the uh, recent... Uh, readings we had in the New Testament and the Gospel of John. And it's, you know, it's a long section. It's very long, but it's broken up over different Sundays. And unless you're able to connect those, you lose so much. So reading the, the summary did that too for a while. They had um, people who would go around and present the Gospel of Mark uh, orally straight through. And I, when I, uh, I watched the DVD version of that, and that was required for a class. And I thought it was going to be like, ugh, I'm not sure. nobody at the seminary is trained to be an actor as far as I know. But boy, I loved it. I thought it was amazing. And it brought all kinds of things that I had never seen before because it had that continuity through it. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. So with our particular section, then thinking about how it builds, narrow in a little bit more as to where we've been recently in Psalm 119 and how it's going to build into our section particularly. So I'm just going to refer back to the immediately previous or preceding section, the iron section. These uh, few lines here, uh, it is time for the Lord to act for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. It's an amazing thing. The psalmist is, is saying that every other way he hates it. Why? Because it leads you to a wrong place. It, it will lead you astray. There's, a, there's, a, there's an, a near infinite number of wrong ways, but ultimately they do lead to the same place. Lots of different paths to the same destination. The psalmist, however, loves God's law, or you know, whatever synonym you want to use here for that, his teaching, um, and he hates to see that law broken. So, so pay, this section is a reaction to that. So if he hates every false way, uh, he wants to be maintained, to be held fast in the true way. And so that's the question, is what is this, what is this true way that he's going to spell out for us here in Psalm 119, 129 through 36? All right, let's turn to that text. This is Psalm 119, beginning at verse 129. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your law. That is our text for today, Psalm 119, verses 129 through 136. Take us into verse 129 there, Pastor Dressler. In the English, it says, your testimonies are wonderful, but the Hebrew word order is a little bit different there, and that's instructive. Yeah, I love that. Hebrew has a couple different ways that they can accent certain words or highlight certain words, and one of them is repetition. So you think about like Psalm 
or no, sorry, Isaiah 6, and you've got off the holy. And that's a way of italicizing, bolding, putting in caps, <laughs> underlining everything that you can do to highlight that word. But another method, and this is actually consistent also in the New Testament, is to take one of those words and to put it at the front of the sentence. Paul does that, in, in or John does that, rather. He says, children of God, now we are. You know, if you follow the strict word order in, in the Greek, that's how it would be, because he wants to, advert, he wants to really um, emphasize what we are now. Um, so in Hebrew here, we got the word wonderful uh, right at the beginning. So it's like his italicizing, underlining, and bolding that words to say that it's, his uh, testimonies are, are truly wonderful or, or miraculous uh, or something like that. And here also, this word for testimonies or, or witnesses, that's the first of the eight words that again refer to this design or law of God that we see popping up here. I think it's also really excellent that not only is he saying you're wonderful at your testimonies, the next line, therefore my soul keeps them. I think that's really important because in our society, we tend to say this is important because it's important to me or something like that. It makes it very subjective. But here, the psalmist flips that on its head. The, the testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, his soul keeps them. Mm -hmm. So it's not just important to the psalmist. And, and they don't find their value only insofar as I think they're valuable to me. They're wonderful in themselves. They're wonderful because they are like, expressions of the way that God designed the world. So they're, they're valuable in themselves. As a consequence of that, they're also valuable to me. But he's, putting, he's not putting the cart before the horse, as it were. He's acknowledging, hey, even if I didn't think so, they're, they're still wonderful. And therefore, I'm gonna, my soul will keep them. Yeah, in that, in that way, it's a prayer that's very similar to the way the explanations to the first several petitions of the Lord's Prayer work in the Catechism, that God's name is already holy, whether I pray mm -hmm. for it or not, and his kingdom is going to come, whether I want it to or not but I pray that these things would happen to me and for me. So similarly, God's testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, Lord, help me to hold on to them because they are wonderful for me. Help me to keep them. So why are they so wonderful? Well, that's what we've been meditating on in the psalm, and we continue to do so there in, in, psalm, in the, the next verse. So why are they so wonderful, these uh, testimonies? Yeah, so the unfolding of your word words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. So I think that word light, it's funny, when I was doing this, I looked at the, the text here, and I was thinking, oh, man, it's not many verses. What am I going to do for this? And I ended up with six pages, how is it, five or six pages of, yeah. <laughs> of notes. No, there's a lot. Um, you know, God's word being uh, uh, inexhaustible. So um, <clears throat> talking about light, you know, this idea of it's, if it's being revelatory, that it, it exposes something to me or shows me something that I would not or could not have known otherwise. And I, and I think you really see that sort of thing borne out in history. Just think about how many different philosophies or ideas or religions there are about what it means to be human. And along with that, how human beings ought to act. Because the question, how should we act, really is has behind it the question of well, what does it even mean to be human? And all kinds of different philosophies and, and religions and moral codes have tried to unpack that. Some were better than others. Melanchthon, for, for instance, refers to Aristotle very positively in his work, the Loki Communes. Now, it's interesting because he wrote that in 1521. Several editions came after that, but he references Aristotle, and Luther referred to Melanchthon's work as one of the best things he'd ever read. But that included this commendation of Aristotle. You see it also that it's always referred to in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, where he describes Aristotle's ethics as a fantastic work. He says, after all, Aristotle wrote so eruditely about social ethics that nothing further needs to be added. <laughs> so he really has high thoughts of, of Aristotle. And Luther, too, he, he once famously referred to philosophy as, as a prostitute. And I think that's the quote people like, because it, it's you know quintessentially Luther. <laughs> this bombastic thing that is, he takes the, uh, whole, thousands of years of thinking and just, bah, whatever, throws it out. But he also said this, he said that Aristotle excellently and very learnedly wrote about ethics. Indeed, the books of both Aristotle and Cicero are very useful and of the greatest necessity for the regulation of this life. It's interesting, on the one hand, Luther can talk about throwing philosophy out that it's being a prostitute. On the other hand, he has apparently such high regard for, for Aristotle and for, for Cicero. So I think it's important to remember with respect to Luther and his thoughts about 
philosophy is he, he hated philosophy insofar as it stepped out of its boundaries. Mm. When it started dealing with our relationship with God, then it became problematic because then it, 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 it will, will inevitably end up being a, 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 a theology of works, essentially. Mm. Philosophy, he thought, was very helpful when it comes to matters on, on this earth. So, so long as it stays in the horizontal realm, perfectly fine potentially exceedingly useful, at least when it comes to, to Aristotle. Um, but when it sneaks its way upward into heaven, when it, when it stops being horizontal and switches to uh, vertical, uh, then we've got a problem because what we end up doing is we, we, have, we switch how we use our reason. Mm. So when philosophy is used exclusively in, in this world, that's probably good, and depending on the type of on the, depending on you know, who the philosopher is and how well it accords with scripture. But what can end up happening is that we end up with a magisterial rather than a ministerial use of our reason. So rather than reason being used in service to the Word of God, our reason becomes primary and paramount so that we, whatever doesn't fit within my rationality, whatever doesn't make sense to me logically, that aspect of Scripture gets left out. And so my reason becomes the, um, the main thing. Uh, but what you do see through <clears throat> many ancient philosophies and religions is that there is this kind of this through line, a thread that sort of runs through all of them. I think today people are much more happy to talk about the discrepancy in ethical systems and morality across time and space. Uh, they like to point out all the differences, and there are a lot of differences. There is a lot of contextual uh, difference that's there. But I think what's more interesting is the, is the degree of continuity. The fact that you have people groups that at least as far as we know, have, have no contact with one another, arriving at very similar codes of law is, is really remarkable. There was a professor at the seminary a long time ago named Ray Winkle who wrote a book called The Voice of Conscience. And I really quite like that book because what he does is he cites all these different codes of law from around the world and shows how remarkably similar they are to the law that we see in, in the Old Testament, we the Ten Commandments especially. So we see that a lot of these instantiations of law from around the world are really just expressions of the law written on the heart. God hardwired people to act in a certain way, and you can see some of that continuity across time and space. Before people get too upset with me, obviously we're going to say that the most accurate articulation of that law is in God's inspired, inerrant, revealed word in, in the scriptures. There he really does show us how did a human in relationship to other human beings and also toward God. So that's where it's clearest. But again, you hear echoes of that throughout time and space as well, which is really fascinating. And so I, I want to also focus on, so I appreciate the, the thought of the light and the way this reveals. I think in the, the first word of the, the sentence as well, the idea of the unfolding or the opening of God's word, that this is something that like shines all over the place. And it's not just a, a one and done sort of thing, but it continues to open, to unfold, as we were talking about earlier, and that shines light. And maybe if you think about the way that the scriptures unfold and the way the light shines, then you can think about how the light expands all the way from the, the first day into then the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, when the light shines in the darkness of the up there in, in Galilee, where the people were sitting in darkness, this, this unfolding of the light, this revealing of the light that God does throughout history, that's what comes finally in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, exactly. The psalm says, your words give light. I think ultimately we're going to say, your word, your word gives light. Yeah. Jesus says this in John 8, I'm the, the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the psalmist talks about the testimonies of God being light. Jesus says that he is light, that he is the lux, lux mundi, the light of the world. So we'd say something like this, maybe that Jesus isn't the written light, he's the embodied light of God, which is such an incredible thing to think about. What I think is, is even more amazing is we ask the question, okay, so Jesus is the light of the world. What does that mean? It means, at least for one thing, we'll come back to the second part of this, but at least in, in one sense, it means he shows us what it means to be human. That question that all those philosophies and religions were asking, what does it mean to be human? And as a consequence of that, how should I act? What's fascinating to me is, the place where Jesus is most clearly the light and where he shines the brightest is in the darkest of all possible places, which is in the cross. It's a, an amazing paradox. I think it's so incredible that when 
Pilate is trying Jesus and he's been beaten and he's been mocked. And then Pilate and his soldiers parade Jesus out in front of these crowds, the mob. And one of the lines that Pilate says is, behold the man. And as a child, it always stuck out to me. That seems a weird thing to say. But I, I've been reading, reading about different things about this, and, and it seems as if this is one of many instances in which characters within the gospel say things that are way more profound than they realize. Another example, it's better that one man should die than the whole nation. <laughs> he said, okay, well, amen to that. That's wonderful. All right. So the pilot here too, behold the man. It's absolutely right. So Jesus, as he's dying on the cross, really shows us what it looks like to be human. I think the first aspect of that is his relationship to the Father, his relationship to God, uh, where he lives his life totally out of control. He, he doesn't say, I don't want to do, I'm not going to do this. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then he actually goes and, and lets all this happen to him. There's this radical handing over of everything into the Father's hand, this, this faith and this trust toward God, even to the point of, of death. Mm. So that's the one aspect. And then the other aspect, too, is it shows us not only what is the proper human disposition toward the God the Father, but also what is the proper disposition toward our neighbors. What do we see Jesus doing when he's on the cross? For one thing, he's turning the other cheek. He's getting slapped around. He's getting, he's getting scourged and obviously crucified. And he could have called down legions of angels and destroyed the whole lot. He could have spoken them into non-existence if he, if he wanted to. But he doesn't. He actually follows his own preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek. He does that. <clears throat> um, he also prays for his neighbors. He's praying for the very people who are crucifying him because he says they do not know what they are doing. It's incredible. And then finally, he's pouring out his life for them as he forgives their sins through this action. So yeah, we see that not only are God's testimonies and his words that are written in the scriptures light, but also the word of God, Jesus, the incarnate word of God himself is light as he shows us what it is to be a creature of God. And that light that opens up from God's Word then gives understanding to the simple, which I think is a remarkable thing, especially in, in light of what you're talking about with philosophy earlier and the number of ways that people have reached out and tried to understand things in their simplicity. Where is it that simplicity is overcome and it is turned into understanding? It's when God opens his mouth, when he shines his light through the unfolding and revealing of his word. Yeah, no, I, I, I really love this because you know, I heard recently there, there was a French philosopher, Michel Foucault, right? And not a great guy. <laughs> he stretched the imagination. He, he lived a very, what we would say uh, is an evil life. He had all kinds of sexually deviant propensities that he acted upon and tried even to get codified into law. He and several of his mm. buddies tried to make certain sexual practices legal that are still illegal today. But apparently he had an IQ of 180. So ridiculously smart guy. And there have been ridiculously smart philosophers in the past who try to try to figure these kinds of things out. But then I think about people that I've known in the past, Christians who are in the past, and they're not, I'm not saying that they're not smart, but they're not an IQ of 100. I'm not an IQ of <laughs> anywhere near that. But it's, okay, whose life turned out better? <laughs> in, in the way that, they're, that they've lived their lives, are they scrambling desperately to try to make up some code of law for themselves uh, that either, at least in Foucault's sense, justifies their immoral practices or that misses the mark somehow? Or you have these people who are just ordinary folk who listen to God's word. It's when you live within God's will, it tends to turn out well. Not always, but it tends to go a lot better than it would otherwise because it is hardwired into the world and you're not cutting against the, the grain, as it were. Yeah, yeah. So it is God's word that opens and shines light and gives understanding to us when we are simple. God be praised. We're going to keep looking at this part of Psalm 119 more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Martin Dressler this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers 
with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, September 17th. We're studying Psalm 119, verses 129 to 136 with Pastor Martin Dressler. He serves at Salem Lutheran Church in Blackjack, Missouri. Pastor Dressler, prior to the break, we left off with verse 130. Now we turn to 131. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. The longing for God's commandments has been a theme in several stanzas. The Opening the mouth and panting is a pretty vivid image connected to that. Yeah, it reminds me of that song, As the Deer Pants for the Waters. Yeah. There's, there's that connection as well. So he does. He, yawns for, he yearns for God's Word, because not only because it gives him wisdom and shows him how to act, but also because, one of, again, one of the synonyms for this is this idea of oracle or promise as well. And so he longs for those promises. I think ultimately what we can say is, as you mentioned, this unfolding of life that occurs from the Genesis all the way through the incarnation of Christ, and then we're looking forward to the second coming as well, is the idea that the psalmist is, is, is longing ultimately, even if he's not quite fully aware of what he's yearning for, I think ultimately he is yearning for this incarnate word. You think about the days when God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, that's really what we want, that's what human beings want, and that's what, this, what the psalmist wants as well this inchoate yearning within him. One of the things that comes to mind is that the Mary and Martha story when Jesus comes to visit. And Martha, we all know the story so well. Martha is busy making jello something or other in the kitchen, if she were Lutheran probably. Uh, and then Mary is the one who's sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to his word because that's ultimately the one thing needful. That coming through pretty clearly in what this psalmist is saying as well. But <clears throat> going into the New Testament, into after the resurrection of Jesus, what strikes me is the passage from Luke when you've got the disciples on the way to Emmaus, and after Jesus has, has departed, after he's disappeared, he's uh, broken the bread and given thanks, and their eyes are finally open, they say to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? So there is this consistent theme of a yearning for the word of God because of everything that it gives to us. I think you and I probably saw that rather clearly when COVID was in full swing. Yeah. Um, Many of the conversations I had with parishioners were, I say, I miss a lot of things, but I really miss going to church, yeah. <laughs> really miss going to church. And, and they say, yeah, I know it's online, but it's not the same thing. And it's true. It's not the same thing. It's a poor substitute at best compared to actually going and being among God's people, hearing them speak God's word to you as well in the hymns and in the creed and being strengthened by their confession of faith and to see the pastor look at you and declare the absolution and physically hand the host and the blood into your hands and into your mouth. What an incredible thing that is. So yeah, that theme of, of yearning and panting, that's going to be with us. We look forward to that day when it's completely satisfied with Christ's return. That is an interesting phenomenon in the life of, of the Christian. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. They will be filled. And, and yet, within the life of the Christian, when Jesus opens his mouth and we are satisfied by hearing his words, then that stirs up in us the desire, the longing to hear more. And it just, it's a continual, I, I, I think both things are happening at once in the life of the Christian. There's a continual being filled by the word of God, and yet a continual longing for more. That's a, a wonderful thing to experience, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a very cool way of putting it. Yeah, so this is, we see this in play throughout this psalm, we see it in play in our own lives. The psalmist then prays in verse 132, Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Talk to us about God's turning and being gracious. So <clears throat> that is a, a very frequent request that you'll see in the psalms. It really does, it pops up all over the place. And what they're asking for, ultimately, is, is God's 
They're asking for God to turn to them with his favor, to turn to them with his grace, which is exactly the opposite of what happened to Jesus when he was on the cross. He calls, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the response is exactly nothing. <laughs> God, had, the Father, had turned his back on the Son, so we can associate this turning away from with despair. What I think is so great about this particular verse here is the fact that it says, as is your way with those who love your name. So it's not as if he's asking for anything abnormal or anything extraordinary. It's like, this is God's habit, right? It's God's habit. It's his tendency. It's, it's within his character to turn to those who love his name. Um, but it's through his actions. We can see this throughout scripture. It's through his actions that God shows himself to be a, a character whose steadfast love endures forever. Uh, that, that's one of the, I think, the distinctions between hymns that we have in our hymnal and some of the more recent music that's been produced that tends to highlight the attributes of God, which are certainly worth talking about, but they also tend to leave out the actions of God. What has God actually done? Whereas if you go into the scriptures, the hymns that we see sung in the, in the, in the scriptures, think about like uh, right after the Exodus, the hymns that, songs that were sung then, they refer to specific actions that God has taken. And our hymns do the same thing because they refer to specific actions, especially within Jesus Christ uh, that God has done. So <clears throat> this is also the way toward us that God promises in baptism, this idea of turning to us and being gracious to us. Um, that's his, the pleasure and promise that he makes in baptism. Mm, yeah, I, I love the way that that's said. This is God's M.O. This is the way that he <laughs> yeah. operates. Is he he turns his his face toward us? The that is the the idea is that God looks at you. He, he faces you with his grace. You can think of the words of the ironic benediction that's spoken at the end of many of our worship services. That God would lift up his countenance upon us. He would look upon us uh, with his grace. And and as you said, the the beautiful thing in the the life of Jesus is when God actually turns his face away from his son. So that we have the promise, we will we will never have that happen to us. I actually I owe this observation to to Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. When you think about the three prayers that Jesus said from the cross, he said seven things, but three of them were prayers. And you listen to Stephen at the end of his life. Stephen repeats two of the prayers of Jesus: the one about forgiving those who had who were executing him, and the one about his spirit being received by the Father or by the Lord Jesus, is the way Stephen prays. But Stephen does not pray, my God, why have you forsaken me, like Jesus yeah. did. And I, I think that that's when we think about God being gracious to us, we don't have to worry that God's going to forsake us, because Jesus took that prayer on the cross, and he, he fulfilled it. That's really cool. Yeah, I like that. So we continue then into Psalm 119, this section, verse 133, the prayer is, Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. The theme of the way has been a consistent theme in this psalm, and so to have the steps be steady is a very fitting prayer in this context. Yeah, I think it is, because again, referring back to the previous section, this I am section, he hates any way that leads away from God. And so the psalmist is, is concerned, and, and, and rightly, because <clears throat> although he loves God's truth, I think he, he has, he, without really realizing it, he's got a very good Lutheran uh, disposition going on here, this simul justus et peccator. And I think it's the et peccator side that he's really uh, bringing to the fore here. Uh, Paul brings this out, too, in 1 Corinthians 10. Oh, he writes, therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Uh, so I think that is an important thing for, for Christians to bear in mind, that all God, though God has laid claim to us, the Christian can still reject God's promise. God's not going to back down, but it, it's, it's that, that whole paradox of somehow sinners are still able to say no thank you when it comes to God's promise. And that's really what this what Thomas is concerned about. He doesn't trust himself because he knows that this old man still hangs around his neck. Yeah. He struggles with that wonderful word. I, I really like that word, concupiscence. It's great because it does. It shows this inclination or this bent toward doing what is evil. It, it's, there's one hymn. I'm trying to remember which one it was now in their hymnal. And it says, take away the love of sinning. And every time I sing that hymn and that line, love, love divine, all love's excelling. I think it's in that one. I think you're, yeah. I, I can hear it in my head, but I'm trying to... <laughs> You keep yeah. talking, I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I come across that line when I was younger, I used to think, who loves sinning? And the older I get it, the more I was like, like everybody. It's the consequence of the sin we hate. 
and the life of a Christian as well, there is this, there, and, and the same thing you mentioned, this dual thing going on earlier with the satisfaction with the word, but also the yearning for the, for the word. You can say the same thing is true with sin. We, we hate sin and we hate doing things that are opposed to God's will because we know it's not good for us. It's not good for anybody. But at the same time, we still like it. And so it is. It's just this, conf- this conflict that's constantly going on with us. And the same thing is definitely true for us today, that we need this daily return to the font, this daily return to our baptism, and the practice of, by the power of the Holy Spirit, drowning those sinful tendencies so that they don't make us their slaves again, so that we don't become slaves of sin once more. Ultimately, though, the psalmist does know who can keep his steps from slipping off the path. Right? He, he's not saying, I'm going to do this of my own free volition, of my own willpower, or anything like that. In, in the words of, of Paul in Philippians, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So it's going to be God who keeps your feet on the path. So I think that's really wonderful. There was a book written by Adolf Kaberle. The, I think it was the, what is that called? The Holiness of God. Not by the holiness. the Quest for Holiness. The Quest for Holiness. Thank you. Yeah, the Quest for Holiness. And uh, he talks about how oftentimes we tend to think of justification as being God's work and the sanctification being our work. And he makes it very clear that, no, actually, both are God's work. And you can see that, you'll see that at the, at the end, I think, especially, because when you're in the midst of it, it sure seems like it's you. <laughs> it sure seems like it's you doing this stuff, right? But then on the last day when Christ comes back, we're going to see that not only was it Christ who worked salvation uh, in you, who, who justified you, who gave you his righteousness, <clears throat> but all along the way, every step of the way, it was the Holy Spirit working within you who also developed that, that sanctity, that, that, that sanctification within you as well. So it's God from, from top to bottom all the way through this. Mm. It, you are correct about the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, that cool. has the line, take away the love of sinning. It's in the second stanza. In Lu- this is Lutheran Service Book 700. But I think just looking at that, that stanza as a whole kind of helps. So take away the love of sinning. Alpha and Omega B, end of faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty, which that last line, set our hearts at liberty, I think fits very well with what you were saying about, and this, what this verse says about let the iniquity, let sin have no dominion over me. So often we think in our sinful nature that sin is freeing, but it's actually the exact opposite. It is the way of God's commands, the way of his word that actually puts us at freedom and sin is what would be the tyrannical master over us. Yeah, I, I, I use a silly illustration for my, my confirmation kids, but I think it works pretty well. You think about a train on tracks. Is the train free when it's on tracks? But yeah, it's able to get from point A to point B. And But okay, but a train, you can imagine a train having a, some sort of personality saying, I want to be free, and so it jumps off the tracks. <laughs> mm. Yay! <laughs> yeah. How free are you exactly? Yeah. So when the Lord takes away the love of sinning, there he is actually setting our hearts at true liberty. And so again, the prayer, keep the steps steady. Keep the train on the tracks, dear Lord, so that I do not fall into the slavery of sin yet again. Verse 134, redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. What kind of oppression might be in view here? Yeah, I don't know for sure, but we we can at least imagine that it could be physical or spiritual oppression. It could, could definitely be both of those things, situations around the world where Christians are martyred or are under severe persecution and pressure, preventing them from doing the kinds of practices that would enable them, uh, theoretically at least, to grow in the faith. Although it's amazing is you do see that oftentimes the church in persecuted areas tends to be very strong, lean and mean. <laughs> Howard Watts mm. put it that way one time for, I think that works pretty well, lean and mean. But I think at least in our context, the spiritual oppression is probably more of a problem. So you see people who present ideas that are contrary to the gospel in, in, in an incredibly persuasive way, and so persuasive that, that Christians are sometimes tempted to, to follow them. So you know, one of the things that comes to mind is atheism, for example. In the early 2000s, there was a series of books written by a group of guys that were referred to as the New Atheists. And they were, firstly, they had a terribly provincial view of what Christianity was. They, they, oh, and so that was bad, among other things, that was bad. But they're all really good writers. They are funny, and they're rhetorically absolutely brilliant. And so and they're fun to listen to, they're fun to read, just because they can work with words in, in, in just a wonderful way. And so they present a case for atheism that seems winsome and excellent, but it's the form that, that hides 
the substance of what's actually underneath all this stuff. Another example would be something that could almost refer to as something like moral, moral relativism. And so an example today would be something like, oh, everybody in society thinks sex before marriage is okay. Nobody bats an eye about that anymore. It's, it's, it's just how people do it. Living together before marriage, that's just how people do things. And so eventually Christians can get this idea just because there's so much of it. There's this inundation with it that mm. maybe that's really how it is. And we just need to, to, to update ourselves and go along with the times. The transgender ideology is a similar thing. And what's amazing is that, they, that um, it tends to be couched in very moral sort of language. So doesn't the Bible tell you to love everybody? Why would you say this? Isn't it loving to let somebody uh, pursue this path that, that they uh, feel or sense is right for them? And again, the verbiage and this, the sheer amount of, of, uh, of, of, the, of the material that we're being presented with can really be convincing for Christians. Paul in, in second makes it very clear who it is that, that will enable us ultimately to remain faithful. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, he says, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you, and he will guard you against the evil one. But certainly the case that not everybody in Thessalonica was Christian, and it's also the case that there were people within those congregations that Paul was working with who turned out not to be Christian as well, some that, that hurt him personally. First Thessalonians, he says something rather similar toward the very end of the, 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 the epistle. Uh, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So there's that reminder to us that while we're striving to remain faithful, while we're leaning on Christ, striving to, to stay within his steps, we're remembering also, okay, but who's the one who's holding me fast? And it's God who's holding me fast. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right to see spiritual oppression here, especially, and, and again, not that physical is out of view, but so often in this psalm, the psalmist has talked about the lie, the falsehood that's been attacking. And, and that's not, that language isn't specified here, but I think it's certainly in view that this oppression of man is the oppression of the falsehood. That would tempt the psalmist away from the precepts of God. In verse 135, we do see some of these repetition with intensity. We see some themes that we've already talked about today. Verse 135 says, Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. So the face and the shining bring up themes that we've talked about in previous verses. Yeah, uh, so it, it does, and I think we could say something like this, that the first time, this is in 132, it talks about light. And so you can think about light in two ways, right? Especially when it comes to, to Jesus, and that is that there is this light that sort of shines down and it reveals to us what it is to be human. But there's also this second kind of light, which is a light that sort of, that Jesus is a light that sort of shines upward. So 2 Corinthians 4 uh, says this, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What I think is so cool about this is you almost get the impression here that when the face of God is being referenced, it's talking about Jesus, that Jesus is the face of God. And so what does this face of God reveal to us? Firstly, he reveals through the cross that he's a God who has decided to have mercy and pity upon us, who smiles upon us because of the sacrifice that Christ has made. And also that he's the one who's going who's gonna to make it possible for him to smile upon us. So that when in the beginning, when Adam and Eve were considered good and very good, and that goodness was lost, it, it, when Jesus is baptized, there is the pronouncement again, so my son in whom I'm well pleased. I think God, you know, he's good. That same goodness is given to us through Christ. And so that's the face of God that the, the shining upon us and granting us that forgiveness and that grace. And then we've mentioned this previously, but it's, I think it shows up again here in the context that we've been talking about. God's face shines upon his servant. And mm -hmm. we talked about the idea of dominion and, and where true freedom is to be a servant of God or sometimes the language is stronger, a slave of God, yeah. is actually, again, true freedom. That's where the, the light of his face shines, is on the one that he calls servant. Yeah, absolutely. I really, yeah, that's, that's so true. There's a line from a, a, a contemporary song that I quite like. It's about marriage. Um, and um, it says, uh, uh, to lose your life for another, I have heard, is a good place to begin. To lay your own life down is basically to find your life and I think that's absolutely the case, that human beings were designed to lay our lives down 
And that when it comes to our relationship with Christ is that, well, to lay your life down for Christ is the same thing as gaining your life back in a way that is far more profound and far more beautiful than anything you could devise for yourself. C.S. Lewis talks about it in that way as well, in, in a really persuasive way. I think it's in mere Christianity that he does that. Now, the last verse of our section, verse 136, says, My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. So we have a sense of maybe some of the oppression that's going on here and the way the psalmist reacts. Why is he weeping? Yeah, so I, th- I think you could say that there are at least three reasons why. So the first would be that those who do not keep his law, what the law does, it turns us inside out and it causes us to live our lives for the sake of others. Rather than this natural sinful human tendency of living for ourselves and being uh, in corvatus and say turned in on ourselves, it, it does, it tries to turn us inside out and make us vehicles or for God's love, to make us masks of God, his gloves in the world that work for the sake of others. When that's not helping, or when that's not happening, it's a it's something that is lacking in the lives of others, right? It's something that it's a damned up goodness or a damned up grace that, that is prevented from being uh, shared with others. I think the second uh, reason is that it's sad for that person's sake. And oftentimes that's the side that I think Christians tend to leave out as we look around the world and see people who are living in ways that are contrary to God's will and his law. We tend to focus on enemy. I want to strike that person or something like that. What a terrible person. But we forget that it's probably terrible to be that person. (laughs) It's not so great to be that person either. You're living a life that's less fulfilling. You're living with less meaning. You're filled with less less meaningful life because everything's about essentially what is it that I want or what meaning can I invent for myself, knowing at bottom that the whole thing is made up that the whole thing is a fiction because I just came up with it out of my own head. And then finally, it's less clear. There, there's a lot less clarity as far as, you know, who am I and what should I be doing? So when you're not living, again, we've harped on this, but when you're not living the way that God has designed, you're not receiving the fullness that, that God intended. And then the final, I think the last one is that a person who rejects God's teaching ultimately will not be saved. And so there, there's, there are three reasons at least for the psalmist to shed tears and also for us to shed tears. How should we treat our enemies and the enemies of the gospel? How should we pray for them? Uh, I think we should, I think we can learn a lot from this verse. Mm. Yeah, this is a verse that, at least as I I read it, especially in the context of pastoral ministry, I think a lot of Christians feel especially for their loved ones who have departed the faith. And it's it's not just people in general looking at the world around us. Certainly there is a, a sense of mourning when we look at the way the world has gone off course. But it's often very especially when it's our own loved ones, uh, the, the children of or grandchildren of, of faithful members. And I'm sure you've had those conversations, Pastor Dressler, oh, yeah. where this just fills them with sorrow. So uh, maybe th- and we got about two minutes here to, to wrap things up. Maybe just give us some pastoral counsel, some prayer for Christians who struggle with that. How do we face that as Christians? Yeah, so I, I think the, the first thing to remember is that God's Word can still do remarkable things. Bear that in mind. And I can give you, I can give you a personal testimony on this one. My my brother was uh, very far from the faith. He was living a life that he should, he probably should have. Well, let's say he was very far from the faith. And there are many instances where he could have died because he was living a life that was was not not at all good. I, I could not imagine him ever coming back to the faith. It was a, it had been oh more than a decade, and it, pretty much everything that he had been taught to to love and to value and to do. He had walked away from. Today, he's a member of a Lutheran church and he plays in the band. And I was thinking, like, how did that happen? <laughs> so, you know, it's like the only answer is it's it's God at work. It's God's strategic placing of people in his life. I may have been a small part of that. My mother, who prayed for him, we both prayed for him desperately. Both of us may have been a small part of that. But it's not up to you entirely. That's the other thing to remember is that God will put people into their lives that you don't even know about sometimes, that might say something or do something that it it snaps something, something turns on, and it's wonderful. The Holy Spirit can use all kinds of different things. I guess that the advice would be, don't give up, don't stop inviting, don't stop encouraging, don't stop praying. Badgering, not such a great technique. That doesn't work so well. I think there's a difference between badgering and invitation. That's one of the things about treating someone as as a tax collector and a sinner. That's one of the things that, that, that's mentioned in, in the, the epistles. Treat him as a tax collector. No, Jesus mentions that. Sorry. Treat him as a tax collector and a sinner. And you can say, okay, how did he treat tax collectors and sinners? He prayed for them. And he witnessed to them. 
same thing is true in our lives with our relatives. Don't give up. Don't give up. Pastor Martin Dressler serves at Salem Lutheran Church in Black Jack, Missouri. He's been helping us today to study Psalm 119, verses 129 to 136. Pastor Dressler, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you very much. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this section of Psalm 119, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us again tomorrow as we spend the time studying the next eight verses of Psalm 119. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk with you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.